Everything in the book of Revelation is a bookend to bring things to a close. So when people approach this book thinking, there's something new, there's something different here, it already tells me they are so far off the mark of understanding what this book is about. My greatest grievance with people who teach on the subject of prophecy, specifically end time things, is it's this desire to sensationalize somehow preachers, pastors, ministers, they turn into the worst offenders on this. I've stayed away from this subject because I'm not wanting to tantalize. I'm not wanting to excite people over something that they think is a mystery, which is not. Let me just put something out there, real simple, because you've heard me say this before. What God made in the beginning, he made, he created, formed everything, the days of creation, bringing into existence and creating Adam and Eve. And in, in that whole period of creation, you've got enough information as a bookend in Genesis to the book of Revelation. You have enough information if you... If you didn't have what comes in between, you might be a little hard pressed, but you could get a real good glimpse of something. The tree that was forbidden in the beginning, that one singular tree. Adam, you can have access to anything. It's all yours except for this one tree will be the tree that is returned for the healing, the leaves of which are for the healing of the nations. And if you keep going, you see that in the beginning we have the fall, Adam's succumbing, by Eve's willingness to eat of the fruit, partake of the tree. And then we are basically looking at when, as the first Adam plunged all of humankind into sin and the blueprint of humanity, the last Adam, Christ, not just through his first coming, but at his return, will restore all things. We will have a recreation period that will basically say, what was in the beginning designed to be the perfect relationship of God and man will be in the end. That relationship will be complete. And everything that God intended, imagine it's like a yin and yang, what God imagined over here, his design that was flawed becomes his design that is perfected over here at the end. And everything in between is a shadow and type. You're going through the Old Testament. We went through the shadows and types. We did a whole series on that. But think about it. You get into the book of Revelation, and when John is looking up into heaven, he's seeing and gets glimpses of what we already talked about. There is that temple, or rather the pattern of the tabernacle, that God gave to Moses to build on earth it's why he said, see to it that you build it exactly according to the pattern. Why? Because the pattern, the real temple, if you will, or tabernacle, is in heaven. So God gave the design. So when we read, for example, when John is looking up into heaven in this vision, and he says he sees, for example, the saints that were martyred under the altar, he's looking at what we saw God made Moses to build on earth, okay? So there's nothing. When John is basically receiving all of this vision of the future, there is almost nothing contained in the book that we haven't seen in some way, shape, or form already. So take away the kind of, ooh, are there things that are not yet clear? Absolutely. Let me kind of put a few breadcrumbs out and then I can actually get into what I'm doing here. So the reason why I say this is not tantalizing for me is because I realize it's a lot of work. This is a big undertaking for me. And I already put in a lot of work in what I do for a single hour of teaching. But the reason why this is big work is because in order to take you into the book of Revelation and properly lay everything out, there are so many parts that I have to show you. Numerology is one, and the significance of the numbers. They don't just pop up, as you know, in the book of Revelation. 
Revelation is the, the final book of the Bible and the bulk of everything that John sees, most of it comes in sevens, right? Seven candlesticks, seven churches, seven vials. You get the idea. So understanding the numbers, what they represent is important. Understanding the symbols. Some symbols need to be interpreted literally and some symbols are symbolic of something else. When to know which one is what. These are the things I need to show you, coupled with you can't teach the book of Revelation without teaching the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, and a couple of the other minor prophets that put everything into what I've called the repeatables. Now, you've got people currently teaching the book of Revelation. Why? Because What's going on in the Middle East is enough to go, hey, are we there yet? Are we there yet? There's a big problem. See, this is actually a precursor. But let me tell you what some of the issues are when you don't necessarily know the whole book or you haven't studied the whole book or you're, you're not familiar enough with it. What Daniel says about the ten-toed kingdom that must basically come back which reappears as ten horns in the book of Revelation, actually is something that must happen in the world. And the problem is that people don't, it's been a puzzle how these ten toes, which represent kingdoms, because right now we don't have a number ten. There's nothing that looks like a number ten, but how about this? The European Union, I'm going to love this one. The European Union is actually very interesting. You see that the flag of the European Union, do you know what it looks like? Anybody know what it looks like? It's a dark background and it's got 12 stars in a circle. The creator of that flag, who created that flag, I don't know, I can't remember. This is stuff in the back of my brain in the 40s, the 50s. Guess where they got that, that idea from? The book of Revelation, okay? Except there's 12 stars, not 10. The European Union will become more and more important in our understanding of end times. And the reason why I say that is because the European Union, coupled with some other entities who globally want to forge ideology, and some of which sounds very savior-like, all right, already, but we're not there. Is the spirit of Antichrist already at work? Yes, the Apostle Paul and John wrote and said of this, spoke of this in their day. Now, what John meant when he was writing in 1 John 2 about there are many Antichrists right now, he wasn't talking about end-time Antichrists in context when he wrote, I believe it's in 1 John 2, about the many antichrists now, he was talking about people that had penetrated into the church who were anti-Christ. They rejected, they spread things about Christ that were not true, they were against the gospel. That's what he meant by that in context. But then he says, he goes on to say that there is one yet to come. That's referring to what will happen in the end. So not everything is the same. My issue is a lot of people who are not well-versed enough about the minute details conflate things. If you've ever dabbled in reading the book of Revelation, there is a creature. One comes out of the earth and one comes out of the sea. And they are connected to another personage, the dragon. They are three, and yet they're actually one. Why? Because these are demonic, if you want to call it that, the dragon, I don't know if I have to explain that to you, but false prophet and antichrist, which make up the unholy trinity. The exact opposite or reflection in the negative of God. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everything in the book of Revelation is a bookend to bring things to a close. So when people approach this book thinking, there's something new, there's something different here, it already tells me they are so far off the mark of understanding what this book is about. 
it's as if God is saying, I've got a lot to do. I'm going to send my son. These people, which I've referred to as our Jewish brothers and sisters, are going to reject him. Park you here for a second. I will turn my attention to the Gentiles. And until that time is fulfilled, somebody asked, are you saying that the time of the Gentiles is not fulfilled? Listen, somebody actually wrote this to me, and I mean no disrespect because I love this person very much in the Lord, but they said, well, I mean, Dr. Scott taught that in uh, 1917 or so that the day of the, the, day of the Gentiles was, was fulfilled. Okay, let me, let me explain this to you. If that was true and that was fulfilled, Christ would have returned. It's, that's the way it works. Uh, the time of the Gentiles will go until God says, done. And then all of the stuff that begins to happen is put into a time frame in a series of weeks, weeks of years. And the final period on earth that the Bible is going to talk about in a strange language comes across in weeks of years. So if you were reading the book of Daniel, you would see 49 weeks of years and the final year, which basically puts it as the 50th or a jubilee, however you want to explain that. But the final year, the last seven-year period, is the last seven-year period basically being unfolded in the book of Revelation. Depending on your understanding and where you stand, and I'll get to this in a minute, there are four main ways of interpreting future prophecy. Depending on the way you interpret is how you will understand what's written. Here's the big problem. There are people that would like to tell you that, for example, I, somebody, somebody shared this with me about two weeks ago, that there are some folks out there that are teaching that, you know, the last trumpet, everything has happened, the last trumpet needs to sound, and, and that will happen at the election. I don't know. Listen, <laughs> you know, if, 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 if your, wait, 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 if, if your understanding of Scripture is that, um, let me think of the word here, is that base, you probably should consider not opening your mouth about Scripture, okay? Why do I say that? Because anybody who studies this book seriously knows that blood has not come from the sky into the waters to make rivers and seas turn into blood yet. Has that happened? Amen. Don't talk to me about a third of the world being struck by a plague. You say, well, well COVID hit. And, uh, uh, can I tell you something? Don't even go there. Because a third of the world's population has not died yet. And God's not going to do stuff in secret. Can there be stuff that's happened that fits in that box? Absolutely. Couldn't make anything fit. Can fit a lot of stuff in here. You know, I, I'm assuming that when the, when the Black Plague, when the Black Death was sweeping over Europe, they said, this is it. This is the end of the world, right? Because they didn't know what the heck they were dealing with. It wasn't. And we can keep going on this, but the problem is when people get into this, well, that's already happened. Well, you tell me when frogs or whatever type of boils, have, have, have any, has any person on earth here been covered with boils yet? Because if you have, please step forward. No, don't actually. <laughs> So you get my point. It's extremely irritating to me when people take the idea. It's like um, almost like somebody wanting to gaze into a crystal ball, and they treat it that way instead of looking at it as God's plan is going to unfold. So a couple of things. When we read the book of Revelation, when we study the book of Revelation, I'll give you another example. You've got the very opening sequence, after he sees, after the fourth and fifth chapter, after he's looking up into heaven, the sixth chapter of the book begins with a, a book, a scroll, that is sealed with seven seals on it. Not seven different scrolls. One scroll with seven seals on it, with writing inside and out. And as these seals are opened, things unfold. The first of which is the appearance of Antichrist, the man on the white horse. I'm going to ask you this question because there's enough contained in this book to tell us 
the details, not the full picture, but some details of this person. If anybody here has studied the Antichrist, can you tell me? Yes or no? Has this person stepped on the public stage and began speaking great words and performing with their false prophet great miracles yet? So how can you tell me that the seventh seal, everything's happened up until the seventh seal, because it hasn't, okay? So that's why I said to you, and this drives me crazy, because when people are misled, you may not understand it this way, but this is how I understand it. Someone who's just teaching to sensationalize, they are probably going to mislead you. I'm not wanting, as God is my witness to the best of my ability, I want to point you in the right direction. And if there's any gray area, you go back to looking to Christ. You don't go looking for these other cool things that are going on. Let me give you another one, and then I will get into my message, which I prepared. You got people saying, oh, it's already happened. All these events, we're just waiting for the other shoe to fall, so to speak, proverbially. Okay, then you tell me, because it also tells us in this book, that the Euphrates River will be dried up. And that must happen in order for some supposed demons who are chained under the Euphrates to come up. The Euphrates is not dried up yet. It is drying up, by the way. It is. You can go on the internet and find a NASA map. So you know it's good, right? It's not somebody's playing around with some map somewhere and photoshopping it. And you can see if you compare from 20 years ago they anticipate, by the way, the Euphrates River will be dried up probably somewhere between 2040 and 2050 at the rate it's drying up right now. Okay? This happened one time before, but it didn't dry up completely. This one, they're saying it's going to dry up completely. So if you look at the sequence of where this occurs, and somebody says, oh, it's already happened already. Well, tell me, are you talking about the time when it kind of almost dried up and then it filled back up again, and that was a man-made issue that happened? No. See, what I'm saying is like too many people take something like, oh, I stubbed my toe. Oh, that means that I've dashed my foot against the stone and I've got victory. Reading into things like crazy, crazy stuff, okay? That's my pet peeve. So let's do this in a orderly way. We will start with some basics. The word that we use to talk about end time events, eschatology, is from a Latinized form of the Greek word Exkatos or eschatos, last, furthest, uttermost extreme or remote in time, space, degree from the Proto Indo European EGHS, because I don't really know how to pronounce that, exco, suffixed from the form exed out, so essentially like the Greek word ek, out, and ology, like our word theology, the study of whatever you're studying, all right? So these are really the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Those are kind of summed up in, in simplicity. Now, here's the crazy thing. You have, in your own time, you have read this word, eschatos, many times, referring to last, the last things, when Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, I am the beginning and the end, I am the first and the last, the word last, eschatos. So when we talk about the things that are end, we're referring to this English word which has its roots in the Greek, of course. So we make the simple study of this as in pertaining to man, God, and then we'll call it the eternal purposes, which encompass heaven and hell. In the Old Testament, we find concepts, and they're, they're very, they're scant, and you've got to kind of read between the lines. Underworld, for example, the Hebrew word sheol. Uh, but if we truly understand this concept of final things, which, strangely enough, why would you put final things right at the beginning of the Bible, right? But there is actually the beginning of final things right there in Genesis 3.15. After the fall, Genesis 3.15 is often referred to as the proto-evangelion, the gospel before the gospel, because of what's said there. It's almost like a promise God's going to make good on. So when we talk about things in the distant future, 
that actually starts the process. But to crystallize it or to make it, we'll call it the, the breadcrumbs of what that might look like, you go back to the garden. You go back to the time of Adam and Eve when they had full communion with God. And after that fruit that was consumed, that was the, we'll call it from the no-no tree, all right? Uh, the fate, the future, the condition of humankind obviously changed. They were what we call now out of fellowship with the Creator, ousted out of the garden, and the distance between man and God keeps getting bigger and bigger, right? He drives them out of the garden. And this is what's crazy. God drives them out of the garden. The purpose, by the way, for driving them out of the garden, it wasn't like, oh, I'm angry at you and I'm mad. It was that had they gone back in the garden, they would have most likely eaten from that tree, which would have made them live eternally in a fallen state. That's what people don't understand. They think, oh, well, it's a big deal. That's the big deal. So, you know, if you'd like to live eternally and never achieve the perfect communion with God, yeah, tell them to go back and eat that fruit. But sorry, good luck in finding the garden now anyway. A little bit late for that, right? But the point I want to make is by the time God calls Moses, very interesting. He basically, he calls Moses, he talks to Moses, and he says, build me a tabernacle where my presence might dwell among the people. And just that concept right there is quite radical in terms of, you might, what does this have to do with final things and end of days? It shows you God had a desire to commune with his creation. And that desire was articulated in build me a tabernacle where my presence might dwell among the people. Now God begins, not that he didn't see it before, but it's in his face now that people are not respecting, they are not honoring, they are not basically responding and this is what's interesting. Even though God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden for the specific purpose, he comes back and he says, to be with these people, my people, right? That only lasts for a certain time, but take the concept and bring it all the way into the book of Revelation where the opening, in the opening chapter of the book of Revelation, John sees Christ walking amidst the candlesticks. Here, once more, God's presence first amongst the churches, and then ultimately at the end of the book, it shows man and God back in perfect communion, basically abiding together forever. That's why I said, if you want to simplify the book, just go to the book of Genesis and, and say everything that God intended for man at the beginning, which was ruined by sinning man, will be restored at the end. And right in the middle, reveals to you that the only way we could get back there was through God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. So the whole picture is painted for us. The things in between, those difficult things, if you will, are God's way in the book of Revelation of showing how he will deal with certain things. Remember, it wasn't just humankind that was affected when the fall took place, the earth was cursed, you remember that? It also tells you that as the earth was cursed, every animal in the animal kingdom creation would be eating of the cursed ground and the blanket of the curse fell on everything. I don't think there were weeds before the curse, for example. Now, take all of this, and this is why, again, beginning and end, why does it say, and the lion will lay down with the lamb? Or the type of understanding that we have says, the communion will not just be God and man, but creation in totality. Now for that to happen, God's got to do something radical. He's got to put down and put away everything that has come between him and his plan. In the process of doing that, just as he created the world in the beginning, he will have to recreate the world in the end. Peter says the earth will be burned up with a fervent heat, and the, there will be a new heaven and new earth descend, and that is where the people of God are going to live. Now hear me out very carefully, because the picture I'm painting is not very tantalizing, is it? It just shows you God is going to accomplish his purpose. What he didn't get to do here, he will do here. 
And all the things that are in between, they are demonstrations of God's authority, his power over everything on earth. Humankind, those who accept, those who reject, the animal kingdom, those that will be subdued and those that will not be subdued. So it's impossible to look at approaching a book like Revelation without understanding if you look at this whole book and you start entertaining craziness, it will be complicated and confusing to you. But if you keep it simple, see last week I talked about two chapters in general answering somebody's question out of Revelation 17 and 18. And I knew do, answering that question would open up probably a lot more questions for other people. That's why I walked you through the history of Babel to take you all the way to the end of the book to show you mystery Babylon. Well, that is essentially the source of all rebellion, the source of all false religion. It represents both the ecclesiastical in chapter 17 and we'll call it the commercial, that which merchandises the people. But two different things. They all come back to the same concept, rebellion and rejection of God. Man's desire to do it himself. That's why I talked to you about the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is probably the most important happening after the flood. Why? Because it shows you this was a corporate rebellion on a much larger scale. Let us build, let us ascend to the heavens. Essentially, man doing what only mankind, and I don't mean man as in gender, I mean humankind, doing what they do best. I will get up the hill, I will build, I will become, I am, right? That's the nature and the evil that resides in all of us to some degree or another. So when we talk about trying to understand end times, a lot of times we have to look at how First in the Old Testament, how did they understand death, dying, and whatever laid beyond? And then what was revealed to us in the coming of Christ, which radically changes our understanding. It actually crystallizes and clarifies that we're not going to some ambiguous, shady, murky, watered underground. And as I've said before, and people talk about where is heaven and where is hell, I believe they are in dimensions parallel to us. Listen, technology is at least showing us this one thing. The space race proved one thing. <clears throat> Once you leave the Earth's atmosphere, say you can get up to the moon or wherever you want to go, you're in space. You want to tell me what else is in space? Because I don't know what is above space except more space. Somebody said, well, what about under the Earth? Because there's lots of references to under the Earth. What I just mentioned to you about the demons underneath the Euphrates River, how, will, how is that possible? First of all, with God, all things are possible. I don't know. But if somebody said, well, why don't they go and start digging? Huh. <laughs> Here, let me give you a shovel. <laughs> Knock yourself out, right? So the important part of <clears throat> trying to understand is first understanding how the Old Testament folks understood certain things. So, for example, we have a reference out of Job. I'm just going to read it. Don't turn. This is a very quick reference. We kind of read Job with a little, I'd say, sometimes not, it's not a historic reading. So we tend to be a little bit more light with Job, but there's something that kind of makes sense. He says, oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eye shall no more see good. The eye of him that hath seen me shall, no, shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not, meaning I live no longer. As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. Now, what's interesting about Job's understanding is the same man who said this, said, I know my Redeemer lives. Kind of a strange universe of, of thought process. But what he says tells me that he understood once, in his mind, once you're gone, you're gone. But if you look at other writings, for example, I think it's Psalm 86 where the psalmist says, and you saved me from pit of hell or from the depth of the grave. 
whether that means the person's life was spared or whether they came up from the grave, which many interpret that way. Remember I told you interpretation. But we can know that there wasn't a defined understanding. There just wasn't. You know, if you read rabbinic literature, for example, you're going to pull your hair out because it's, everybody has a different say and a different opinion. But the reality is if you're analyzing this scripture, you can break down Old Testament understanding of afterlife and, let's say, eternity by two concepts. One would be everything leading up to the exile, that is that period we've been talking about, the 70 years in Babylon. And I'm going to include that 70 years because some prophets were writing during that time while they were in captivity and then post-exilic. So everything leading up to that point, and why do I say that? Because Daniel, Daniel, who was carried away, he says something pretty fantastic. In Daniel 12, he says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. That was not an Old Testament thought process. This is Daniel in the Old Testament speaking actually prophetically about the future. They didn't have this understanding. So definitely we know prophetic. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, again, repeated, he says here uh, two times. One is to seal up the book. And I said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. And then the last verse of the last chapter of the book says, but go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. You, you will stand in your lot is a, a way of saying colloquial, you'll stand in your reward or your inheritance at the last day. That's radical for the Old Testament. That's Daniel speaking, saying there will be a resurrection. Speaking of, by the way, and at that time shall Michael stand up, that's telling us something about a future time which we can confirm and read about in the book of Revelation. So when I say we have to look carefully, you can see by the time Daniel's writing, by the time Daniel and Ezekiel specifically were getting much greater clarity on not just death and dying, but what lays ahead. No longer this ambiguous, murky underground or the underworld, or I simply cry out, have mercy, God in heaven, but have no idea of what I'm crying out to. So by the time we get to this period, it's, it's well-developed. The thought process is well-developed. You even have a glimpse of it, by the way, in the book of Jonah. So remember when Jonah is taken by the big fish and he's crying, and it says he cried out of the belly of hell to be delivered. I believe that that was essentially, remember, that is the type of the resurrection. I also believe he was crying out. I don't know if you or I could comprehend this, but whatever that giant fish was, if he had stayed in there a little bit longer, I think he probably would have died. So he's crying out, whatever that means, God delivered him. Now, whether that was God's plan or intention, we don't know, but God delivered him. So there's enough development in the thought process. We cannot say, oh, this is a brand new thought that just occurs in the New Testament. It's, it's right there in the old. So with that being said, it becomes important for us to analyze and to understand. When people talk about the impossibility of the latter days, and especially those people who believe in everything's already happened. Historically, the book of Revelation, some people read it and they say it's already all happened. Well, I just, I want to know one thing. If it's happened, can you tell me what exactly the locust demon looked like? Because I'd, I'd like to know. Never mind, that'll hit you later. Because uh, if, if it's already happened, then you've seen what the locust demon looked like. I'd just like to know so I have a heads up, right? Okay, never mind. 
once we get into the New Testament, we begin to see all the pieces come together. That God was desiring to reconcile the world back to himself, the final uh, cure for the planet, for the people, obviously, is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, taketh away the sins of the world. So that picture begins to emerge. We encounter Christ. No one really knows, by the way, if you're, if you're not listening to me with the mindset, oh, I know everything that unfolds, but if you were a first living as a first eyewitness to Jesus, you probably wouldn't have, like me, I'm saying, I wouldn't have known what to make of this man. Nothing about what he said had ever been spoken like this before, right? So talking about future things, which he did, would be kind of radical, let alone all the other things that weren't future, they were in the now that people didn't believe. So, but we get enough insight in the New Testament that even something like this, when Jesus talked about the destruction of the temple, now, he spoke of the destruction of the temple, speaking of his own body, but there was also a fate being sealed in Christ's day of the temple being no more. He realized that after that period of 70 AD, that's what, 40, some years after Christ's death, uh, resurrection and ascension, the temple basically ceased in all of its exercises and everything because that was, it was done, the fall of Jerusalem occurred. So basically when you look at the fall of Jerusalem and the end of the temple, I want you to think that the temple came from the idea of the tabernacle, God basically living amongst the people, right? So it's as if, if you put that all in perspective, it's, it's as though Jesus, when he was talking about the destruction of the temple, yes, he was talking of his body and the resurrection, but he was also speaking of a time that had come, something that would be no more, it'd be done with. That would usher in, or at least begin to usher in, a whole new epoch, a whole new period, because everything revolved around the temple, the temple sacrifices, which are supposed to be man's relationship with God, right? But that ceased to be a long time ago. We looked in our previous series of how people were just going through the motions, right? So that kind of had its time. Once we also cross over into the New Testament, or if you're reading the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, we begin to get a slightly better grasp because some of those words help us to understand they're not so homogenized as the Hebrew kind of messes us up a little bit. So uh, a study in some of those words for us, for our understanding, will be necessary. I'm just letting you know what, what you're getting yourself into, all right? <laughs> okay. Um, of, of equal interest, I, want, I would like you to turn with me. To sh I want to show you something. In Matthew 22, for example, I'm going to use this one. There could be some other examples, but Matthew 22 is a good one to do it with. Um, I just read from Daniel where Daniel talks about those that are dead. Essentially, he says they are asleep in the dust. Paul will use that phrase too, but here in Matthew 22, there's another concept of afterlife, death, heaven, and hell, and that is this wedding banquet, the parable of the wedding banquet. You notice that um, in this parable, he says the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and you know those that were bidden to come to the wedding, they would not. You know if you've read this on your own, and you get to the place where they invited people off, basically off the street, Anybody that would come in to fill the hall, the banquet hall, right? And a man comes in, and he is not wedding, wearing a wedding garment. That is in verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. He said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? As he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, Take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many are called, few are chosen. That is talking about eternal separation. The fact that there will still be people trying to get into the kingdom, not the way God said. Hmm? Yeah. There will still be people trying to make it into the kingdom of heaven, but not according 
to what God said. When he said you don't have a wedding garment on, there's, there's actually more meaning to this, but let me put it in a more generic way. If a person does not put on Christ, you don't do that, by the way, the Holy Spirit does that to you, but if a person is not put on Christ, you're not, this is the person who came in without a wedding garment. So there's a concept here called eternal separation, separated indefinitely because the person would not. In another place, Jesus says, I am the door. And anyone that tries to get in that doesn't come by way of the door, that's me, Jesus, is a thief and a robber. So he's painting the picture that, remember, narrow, narrow is the way. If it was a broad way, many people would be crowding and going in, but it's a narrow way, and few there be that go in thereat. That, that is a huge statement in and of itself that tells you not all will be saved, but in the process, degrees of things. Here we have eternal separation. In other places, we have a picture, for example, of Lazarus and Dimes, where we have the picture of Lazarus, or I'm sorry, the, the rich man, and that whole depiction which shows a great gap where one cannot cross over. You're either here or you're there, but you're not able to cross over from one chasm, if you will, to another. This is why I'm saying to you, God does not require perfection of us. He gave us the perfected one. He requires that we take him at his word, and just for trusting him and taking him at his word, that is the entrance into the kingdom. He doesn't say, do works, do good, behave, be nice, be great, be awesome. Just says... Be a father, trust me. Pretty simple, right? But we complicate it. So here's a person trying to sneak in. Are there other people or other dimensions of things? Yes. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 18, when he talks about those who were trusting Christ, but he says basically they are asleep. They fell asleep in Christ, which means they were fathers, they died. They will be part of what is called the first resurrection. Why do you think in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the resurrection because he's trying to paint this picture to show you we all saw these people who saw him, Peter, myself, the 500, etc., etc., who all heard him say, who saw him basically come back from the dead. Now there are folks here that are no longer here. They're asleep, but they too shall rise when you get the point. So there is the promise of eternal life for those people who've trusted Christ. There are those who basically will try any other way but Christ and they will find out that that road is, or that pathway is not so pleasant. It is described in some places that some people will find out that their lot may be a whole lot hotter than they thought at the end. So the final section, when we do finally get into studying Revelation, the final section gives us the vision of New Jerusalem, of God dwelling amongst his people, and the sense of what was designed at the beginning. But here's the problem. The problem is that no flesh, no sinning flesh, in this condition can enter in. And that opens up the doors to a whole bunch of weird stuff. I see people talk about when will the tribulation, the great tribulation occur, and who believes what and how do they understand it? So let me walk you through a few of the terms that we will be encountering. I'm going to try, when we start doing scriptural interpretation, to show you how these might fit in to these different categories. But there are four main categories of prophetic understanding for end-time events. One is called A, millennialism. The A in front basically negates it. So these are people who do not believe in a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth. There is no specific uh, date or cycle to it. Uh, they simply believe that since Christ's resurrection and ascension, uh, that the 1,000 years has already begun, that he presently rules on earth. And there's a kind of, again, a, an ambiguity to this whole uh, style of interpretation. But the people that were very heavily latched onto this would be people, for example, like Augustine and even Calvin. So if you're a person who studies, you would know these names. The next group would be post 
millennialism. So if A does not believe that there is not a literal thousand year reign, the post millennial people embraced by the likes of Jonathan Edwards and B.B. Warfield, if you know those names, um, this is also a little bit more challenging. Why? Because those that adhere to post millennialism, well, say that five times, are not unified in their understanding of the thousand years, but believe that the Great Commission, the charge to preach and teach until every creature on earth has heard the gospel and then the end comes, kind of fits into that. And there's a lot of details there as well. The next one, it's, it's one category divided into two parts, pre-millennialism or historic uh, dispensationalism or or millennialism. So with regard to historic pre-millennialism, good Lord, no two people seem to be agreed on anything here. So I'm not helping you right now, but when we get into doing the doctrine, you'll see what I mean, because I'm going to show you at least in one chapter. I may not do it throughout the whole book, because I don't think I want to deal with that, but at least in one chapter, I'd like to show you how these different understandings affect how somebody would understand the text. Does that make sense to you? Because if you have a, for example, if you have a historic view of what is yet to take place, then you fit in the category of people saying it's already all happened. And my argument there is going to be show me where it all happened. Tell me, are we living in a new heaven and a new earth yet? I don't think so. No, I know we are not, okay? Because the all the freaks would be gone, so okay, just saying it. I, I just said what you all wanted to say, okay? Yeah. See? It's okay. I, I'm just like you, okay? So it's just the way it is. In the dispensationalist view, the millennial reign of Christ starts after his return. And I tend to kind of tuck in there. You, you might ask me, where do I sit in all this? Well, I kind of, I'm tucked in there that the millennial reign of Christ must happen, obviously, after he returns. So he must return to earth and then that thousand years. But there are events that must happen before the thousand year ticker starts going, okay, according to this book. Um, if you were kind of going through this, you would also want to be talking about the rapture because that is what's tucked in here. And we, we have to kind of look at this. This is one we are going to pick apart, friends, and we're going to pick at it until it's abundantly clear. Okay. Uh, this is why I cannot just parrot what somebody else has said, especially if I can show you to make a case for or against. And I'm going to do that. I'll show you whatever evidence I feel supports or does not support certain doctrines, that even the genesis of the doctrine of the rapture, okay, that was not being talked about or preached until very modern times. Most people do not know the history of this, so they think, oh, well, it's, it's a doctrine that's always been preached. No, it actually is. It is really attached to American, uh, the American understanding maybe some of our brothers and sisters in the UK, it kind of fits in a little bubble. I'll explain all of that as we get into trying to unfold the book. Um, but these various categories I'm describing become important. Because say you all want to go and you want to buy a book. I, I want to go and buy a book that will help me, or you look online. Book of Revelation, understanding the book of Revelation. Hmm? You better know what you're reading. And that means you better know if the person who is writing, are they in the A, millennialism? Are they fit in that? Or are they post-millennial people? Are they, if they are rapture people, are they people who are professing a rapture before the tribulation, the great tribulation? Some people profess a rapture will happen in the middle of that, we'll call it, the, they call it the middle of the week, but it's really the halfway point, the three and a half year point in the last final phase of what we're calling the last week of years, or the last week on earth, which is calculated in years, seven years. So this all plays into it. And if you don't know what the person believes when you're looking this up, you start reading and you go, oh, well, this person says that in 
the year 1912, blah, 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 and that fulfilled that. And they closed the whole thing by saying, and it all happened. You know, they're in the historic framework. They are saying it already all happened. You must understand this, though, if you're going to do more research to know what the scholar is presenting to you. Because otherwise, if you just, if you just think it's all one and the same, you're going to end up with some very messy theology and really confused understanding of what is going to happen. So I'm just kind of giving you the helps here right now to say if you do engage in research on the internet, please, I beg you, learn what at least the four major groups represent so when you're looking, you know what you're looking at. And then there's something else. The people who like to come up with really crazy stuff. In the 70s or 80s, there was a preacher who said that the, uh, the locust demons, I believe, they were, they were helicopters. And listen, it is almost all like Wild West interpretation. Instead of just looking at what's there, and guess what? It gets really good. See, go back and read the Exodus passages and see the plagues that God poured out. Do you really think that the frogs were frogs? Of course they were frogs. They weren't, they weren't like alien frogs that did special things and, you know, hey, hello, right? No, they were just frogs, right? They were frogs, yes. So sometimes, that's why I'm talking about interpretation, sometimes a frog is a frog, hello? <laughs> and that's what we have to be clear about because if you're not clear on that, you're going to be saying the frog is, uh, I don't know, the frog could be, I don't know, President? I don't know. So that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so I just to be ludicrous to make my point. So you understand what I'm saying. Then there's one last thing we're going to have to deal with. And that is people who conflate. That's a big problem with me. I find this everywhere again. People who say the church is Israel. And then they kind of play this whole because they haven't gone through the studies we've done. So we're going to have to look at that, too, to try and understand. Because remember I told you, the Jewish people will be grafted in, according to what Paul said, but they'll, they're going to have a place here in the end. So understanding that the terminology being used must stay consistent unless the scripture and context give us reason otherwise. Do not conflate things like that. As I said, you're going to be very, very confused. Um, I think probably I've said or put enough foundation out there so you kind of get the idea of where we're going to be going. But I just want to say one footnote on the entire book of Revelation. See, it's kind of ironic. Where are the seven churches? What territory are they located in? What are they located in what would be present day? where those churches are? Turkey. Turkey, right? Turkey actually plays a part here that nobody really can understand. Now, you want to talk about what the late Dr. Gene Scott said, and this is what I don't like when people quote stuff to me, because I think as a person who does research, I've also researched everything that he said. Now, what he said was Turkey has to come out of NATO in order for certain things to happen. Whether that's true or not, the area of Turkey is very important for us. Now, I actually believe that is true. There has to be two nations to fall out of NATO, and that must happen within the next five years. And there's, there's a reason for that, but that's another sidebar we'll get to. But think of it this way. Where was the fire? The fire started on the day of Pentecost, but it spread to Asia Minor, to these churches which now Turkey is 99% Muslim. And I've been telling you something. Globally, at your own convenience, look up what's happening right now in Portugal. Look at what's happening right now in the UK. You will see floods of Muslims wanting to impose Sharia law, wanting the local governments and local officials to engage in certain behaviors. So in a city where church bells are forbidden to ring, the call of prayer is being permitted to go out. 
See, you've got to almost step back and look at some of the things that are happening. Christianity, while this book was being written, was on the rise. It was on fire. It was building. Look at what's going on around you. Christianity is under very, very heavy attack right now. From 2018 to 2023, the rise in crimes against churches and Christians has gone up. It's more, it, it is beyond what I can even quote in terms of statistics. It's doubled or quadrupled. Yet, it's never a crime. Did you notice that? It's never, it's never a hate crime. It's never a crime. Because Christians are going to be squeezed again. Just, I'm just telling you, cheer up, saints, it's going to get worse. Christians are going to get squeezed again. We are seeing history kind of repeat itself in a certain way. At the time of Christ, people didn't dare step out or thereafter, just after his ascension, didn't dare step out and say they were Christians for fear of being persecuted or killed. We are almost heading back into that right now as we speak. Don't think for a second that that doesn't play into what we are going to see in the book of Revelation. Don't kid yourself when you think, well, how could that one swath, the Battle of Armageddon, how could the whole world be looking on? Very easily. You turn on your TV, you look at your tablet, you look at your phone, you're connected to what's happening in the Middle East like that, in a flash. Which, by the way, is very interesting because who would have known, say, even 50 years ago, that that technology was going to come on the scene that would make this possible. Do you see what I'm saying? There, there is nothing in here that's so far-fetched that you'd say maybe 50 years ago they might say, well, how, how, how's everybody going to see this? Well, oh, we'll, we'll, get a, we'll get a TV camera out there and a TV crew out there yeah, right away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but nowadays people just whip out their phone and the minute somebody's recording, it's going live to the Internet and everybody's seeing it instantaneously. So for people that say, well, who's going to see these two witnesses laying out on the street dead? Everybody, everybody who's still here and who's still alive. Again, that all depends on your interpretation of whether or not the believer is going to be here or not, something we have to delve into big time. So we'll start the process, and don't fault me for going real slow because I'm a big believer in this. Clarity has to be there. The symbolisms have to be understood. We cannot engage in sensationalism. We have to approach this in a way that keeps Jesus at the front of everything and none of this crazy stuff that pops up where people start going off, oh. So hopefully, if you're interested, I'll be, that's what I will be presenting and hopefully we, we, don't, we don't have people going, I'm, I'm, you lost me at, <laughs> I, I was in the spirit and looked up and behold, because there's gonna be a lot of that, okay? <laughs> Just saying. So I hope you'll be here. We are obviously starting another interesting journey. I hope you will tag along, and um, I hope to see you all here next week. All right? That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com. Dot com.